They say life comes at you with high velocity, and I believe it comes at you with that and malicious glee at reminding you that you're getting old. I know you'll read this one day, Trandy, so I want to tell you that I'm proud of you and I love you, happy halfway sweetheart. Anyway, I'll just keep on like a normal entry. Well, obviously from above, it's Trandy's halfway today. And just like my parents did for me and my wife's did for her, we got Trandy something to be responsible for. Did we get her something useful? Something like a robot she'll have to maintain and direct? A set of tools that she'll have to keep track of and in good condition? Maybe a personal holopad that she'll have to not misuse and infect with viruses? Of course not. Because my beautiful wife is as stubborn as she is beautiful. We got her a pet. At least we didn't go to a pet shop. I hate those places. I'm pretty sure they buy from mill breeders and poachers. Absolutely disgusting places. Unfortunately, Trandy had no clue what kind of pet would be a good pet, so going to a reputable breeder was out. However, there happened to be an animal rescue shelter on station. By the stars, how fortunate that Trevdy's idea would work after all. Oh, joy. Anyway, the shelter was only slightly less depressing than a hospice. I really hope that all of those animals will get adopted soon, but a lot of them are getting defensive of their kennels, so you can tell they've been there a while. I tried to steer her toward the juvenile animals, but Trandy was adamant that the old boys deserve to at least get a look. Trandy's kindness is something to be developed, not curtailed. So obviously I went along, for better or worse. Well, she laid eyes on this lump huddled into the furthest corner under what looked like a soft blanket or towel with its head sticking out. I thought it was its head anyway, since its eyes were there and what looked like a pair of ears, one to each side. The issue was that it looked puffy and lumpy under a shaggy patch of red fur. I asked the adoption person, stars save me if I know that his title was, what's wrong with its head? The lumps and discoloration are bruising, he answered, and I privately congratulated myself for identifying its head. It survived injuries to its head that severe? Trevdy asked, and I reached over to rub the space between her upper and lower shoulders to comfort her. He has bruising and microfractures throughout his body. Oh, it's a mammal and a male, by the way. From what we can tell over the past three days, the injuries appear to be regenerating. Remarkably, his brain case wasn't damaged despite the severe bruises on his face, and we theorize his bones must be very dense to have sustained such injuries. I do not recommend him for adoption, though, as he has refused any kind of feed we've offered. Don't you know what it eats from a scan? I interjected, hoping the adoption person would drive the point home. Instead, he said, Unfortunately not, since we only have a low-level scanner to detect symptoms of illness or injury. Can't afford a full-level 4 bioscanner. Maybe he's not eating because he's too sad, Trandy asked. My poor heart can't handle being melted like that. Very likely, Animal Control said they found him in a pit-fighting ring. Has it done anything aggressive toward the staff? I asked with bated breath. If it was a broken pit animal, then I would refuse it. No amount of adorable daughter antics could possibly sway me on that point. Well, if we enter to offer feed or to clean the kennel or take him to exercise, he exhibits avoidance behavior. However, if anyone tries to get close to him with a medical device, he will lash out and attempt to destroy the device. We theorize that the pit gangsters used injections to keep him drugged up to make him fight. I want to try going in. I tried to refuse. It was an unnecessary risk. The poor creature had obviously lost the will to live and would probably just lay there like a lump anyway. We can start by letting him see you. We keep the inner door opaque on his side to try to reduce the stresses he's exposed to. I could tell she was nervous as she stepped into the space between the inner and outer doors to the kennel, but a glance toward the huddled lump showed that it heard the door cycle. Its eyes flicked open and they seemed cold to me. Blue like the old stories about ghosts lurking in the bogs. When it could see through the inner door, I saw that his face was actually quite expressive. Its eyes widened. It glanced to my wife and me, and then back to Trandy. I think it was surprised. But instead of tensing under the blanket, it seemed to just lean back a little. The inner door cycled, and Trandy stepped in. It surprised the adoption person. It surprised me. It surprised Trevdy. Stars, I think it surprised itself. When Trandy cooed softly to it and reached out as she slowly stepped forward, 
It didn't flee to the other corner. It didn't even flinch. Instead, it reached its upper appendage and met Trandy's fingers with its own. Well, I was boned. I decided to ask what it looked like under the blanket, and the adoption person very helpfully provided an estimation of how it would look without the injuries. Pinkish skin, two legs ending in feet with short digits, I guessed helped it walk bipedally. Two arms ending in dexterous fingers and opposable thumbs. Only one thumb per hand, though. It had patches of fur in certain areas, under its arms, the groin, and what seemed like a thin layer on its lower legs. Overall, it would look kind of cute, like one of our children, except the wrong color missing a set of arms, a thumb on each hand, and a tail. It might even tolerate being dressed up. That is, if it survived that long. When I objected, my beautiful and wise wife told me, an animal's last days are also a responsibility. There was no way I was getting a robotics buddy. Ignoble. Journal entry, 1. Date, IDFK. Name, Greg George. This is an improvement from the arena, but it leads me to some disquieting conclusions. I was in my cell, trying to get some sleep again. I was pretty sure I was on day three, or at least bowl with five compartments of kibble number three. Well, if they weren't going to force feed me kibble, I wasn't going to eat it. I was just thinking how it was a shame that the cell didn't have anything to tie the blanket to when something weird happened. The outer door cycled, and when the inner door turned transparent, there was no creepy spider centaur thing going clickety-clack at me. There was a four-armed girl there, or armed. A four-armed blue girl. I thought she was a girl because of her dress with lots of flowers all over, and her parents looking through the door at me with a slightly worried look on their faces. The adult female, honest to God, had huge tits. Massive jugs, so the one in the green jumpsuit must have been the male. Therefore, dresses were for girls amongst the blue grivus people. Blivuses. I'm a fucking genius. I should probably be more scientific and shit, but this is my sanity journal, so if any doctor types get their mitts on it, they can suck my balls. Anyway, so the Blivus girl comes into the cell and starts making, like, quiet noises to me, like trying to be all soothing and stuff. So she wasn't going to do anything weird, maybe? So maybe I wouldn't be injected with that weird shit that made my blood feel like fire, and my brain feel like a murder hornet nest, and get dragged off to beat some poor alien to death. Okay, cool, I thought. She reached out toward me, and I couldn't help myself. I reached out to her like Adam on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. It would have been hilarious if these aliens knew shit about art. Anyway, she left, and then I eventually fell asleep. Well, slap my ass and call me baby if I didn't wake up in what looked suspiciously like a storage closet with all of the junk cleared out. At first, I was stoked to not be in either a filthy hole in the deck or a featureless high-tech cell. Then I realized that I'd been put on a big, firm pillow and had the same blanket from the cell. That's when I figured shit out. I was a goddamn pet. With shocking clarity, I realized that I wasn't a gladiator before. I was a fucking pit hound. In that book, it made the fuckers who kidnapped me worse for making me mutilate and kill helpless animals under the influence of drugs. I cried about it. I might actually admit that to somebody if they asked, but I doubt that's in the cards. So, you know, a good quiet cry, since habits electroshocked into you die hard, and I was ready to do a little exploring. The closet was about three yards by four, with a set of shelves built into the back wall, which had one conveniently at waste room with enough room for me to sit up between that and the next shelf. Bed upgrade acquired. One of the other walls was bare, and the other one had a rack of what looked like various hooks for hanging things from. The final wall had the door, what looked like some kind of touchscreen panel next to it, and a bowl of water on the floor. I wrapped myself in the blanket and scooped up the bowl to take a drink of water while I glanced over my ad hoc bedroom again. Score, I don't care how alien a place is. A notebook and pen are a notebook and pen, wherever you go. Sanity Journal got me through the shit back home. Sanity Journal will get me through having nobody to talk to. I'll have to consider my options, but first I want to test the door and see if I can find the pantry. I want food, and not even a family of nice blue blivuses is stopping me. Sneaky breaky time. Journal entry. To date. 
Day 1 I guess name, Greg George Mission, successful by Flim Flam Golly Gosh. I am the goddamned master of skulkery. Hell yeah. Dr. Johan says that it's important to be honest with your feelings in your sanity journal, and I feel like gloating. So first thing is the door. The Blyvises are tall, tall. Come to think of it, the girl from the cell incident towered over me while I was huddled in the corner. I know it was a kennel, but calling it a cell makes me feel better. Dr. Johan isn't here to be disappointed in me, so I'm going to keep calling it a cell. Shut up internal therapist voice. Anyway, Dor, I think that Blevis girl would have to reach up to about her shoulder level to grab the door handle. I had to hop. Now, this being the first time I was fully sober and trying to move deliberately, I did a normal hop. This was an error. I flipping flew up to the top of the door jam. I was so surprised that I grabbed the trim and just hung there for a second, and only thought about drop ambushing my hosts and shouting BOO at them for a little bit. I allowed myself a quiet chuckle, habits and all that, and dropped down to the floor, grabbing the handle on the way down. Hell yeah. Took a minute to examine the door, and it looks like a normal hollow door with a spring-loaded latch. I couldn't find a lock, but if this highly advanced alien society has figured out screwdrivers, then that could very easily change. I'll need a contingency. Objective added. Find long, thin, ridged object. Outside was a hallway, and a glance down toward the open archway got a very clear view of what looked very much like a cartoon. I couldn't tell what was going on, but 2D stylized Blevis was making a bunch of humming and clicking noises in what seemed like a rhythm. I could see the outline of a Blevis in front of the, uh, I guess it's a TV. Although from there it seemed like there was actual depth to the cartoon. As interesting as alien educational cartoons, and how freaking weird they looked when I moved from side to side were, I was more interested in the four doors before me going down the hall. There were two on the left, and two on the right. Doctor number one on the left was obviously a bathroom, if the big, glistening pastel pink tub with a spout sticking out of the wall directly across the door was anything to go by. When I stepped across the threshold, the change in texture from slightly rough and a little giving to polished and slick prompted me to look at the floor. Either the floor in the hall was wood or some kind of high-tech substitute, where the bathroom felt like some kind of enameled metal. It was cold, like enameled metal anyway. To the right was a basin that stood just above my outstretched fingertips, and I could see there was some kind of spout and a handle to either side, so I was pretty sure it was the sink and to the left, there was a long depression in the floor with standing water at the bottom and a button on the wall at just about my eye level on the wall behind it. Great. I'll have to squat for the necessaries. Anyway, I didn't feel like rooting around in the cabinets and drawers along the sink wall, so I just fiddled with the lever over the tub spout. Contrary to all good sense, pushing the lever toward the wall got the water running, and turning it to the right was for hot water. Insane. I shut the tap off without trying to figure out how to divert the water to the shower head and slotted bracket on the wall. It looked like it was meant to be used as a wand or shower head, but without jumping up to grab it, it was useless to me. A glance down the hall told me that nobody was suspicious, or coming to check on the puppy or going to the bathroom. Putting me in the back of the hall was actually tactically sound of the Blyvoses, since I'd have to creep by every potentially occupied space. Somehow I doubt they did that on purpose. The Blyvis outline was kind of slumped, like they were bored of the show. I feel you, kid. I remember waiting for the crappy kitty show to end so the proper cartoons can start. Sympathies aside, it was time to try door on the right number one. This turned out to be the master bedroom. Well, there was a massive bed dominating the space, and the massive floor-to-ceiling chest of drawers and wardrobe along the wall opposite the foot of the bed. A minor detail that I found just a teensy bit disquieting was the overhead storage cabinets on the other walls, including the door side wall. I decided not to root though the tidy room because obviously they'd notice, and I hadn't decided whether I was behind enemy lines or not. I just backed out into the hall and shot a glance toward the end to make sure the board outline was still slumped toward the weird TV, and then a glance upward to confirm my suspicions. Yep. That was more overhead storage. It was starting to feel like I'm in an alien RV, 
which had implications I'd worry about after completing my current mission. Doctor number two on the left was much more promising. Untidy and festooned with plastic and plush objects I was pretty sure were toys. Maybe the Blyvis girl was a toddler. Well, if she was, she had rapidly outgrown her clothes, since when I picked up a pair of what were probably pajama trousers from the neatly folded pile of clothes on the rumpled bed set into the wall, I noticed that they'd fit me. Well, they were far from a perfect fit, since the cuffs rode at about halfway between my knees and ankles, were a tad tight about my thighs, and had an uncomfortable draft about the back on account of the hole for the kid's tail. So I followed my training and yoinked a second pair to wear backwards. Problem solved with the minimal effort. I dropped my blanket to be able to move more freely, but got chilly while searching for anything that would fit my secondary mission objective. Another easy solution, all I had to do was nab the soft shirt at the top of the pile. I pulled the extra sleeves inside the shirt for obvious reasons and went to rummage through the cabin mates and drawers built into the walls, as well as the other berth, which was apparently just a place for more stuffed toys. I don't care how silly I looked in toddler pajamas, they were soft, warm, and didn't drag on the ground like my trusty blanket, all of which were important on account of my lack of proper underpants, how chilly they kept the place, and my desire to sneakify. Doctor number two on the right was obviously Blyvis Girls' room. There was only one berth, and any cabinet door big enough had a poster of the same group of five male blivuses in tattered clothes, gaudy bling, and making aggressively stupid poses toward the camera. God save me, my rescuer is into alien boy bands. I hope they don't suck as bad as Earth boy bands. I gave her room a once-over, but I don't find anything immediately useful. But apparently she was into sketching, if the supplies piled haphazardly on the desk against the wall opposite to the door was anything to go by. I don't know how they judge talent in her culture, but I thought she was a talented 13-year-old or so. I'm glad to find the supplies, since it means that her parents cared enough to encourage her talent and interests, which boded well for my treatment. God, I hope this isn't a sick joke or dream or whatever before I get chucked back into the arena. Whatever. Time to take my cheeky peeky for the sneaky breaky. So looks like the bored kiddo is sitting on the floor in front of the weird TV still. Holy crap, the thing was stupidly huge. Like takes up half of the fucking wall huge. And the room in front of me was like five yards wider than the left and right side rooms. Plus the hallway combined. Oh, and on either side of the hallway were these huge ass sofas, which was convenient for me because the likewise huge space between their backs and the wall was perfectly me wriggling sized. This way, I could avoid Bleavis mom, or mom because that's shorter, who was keeping half an eye on the toddler from the other sofa. I went right and peered out from the shadows to gauge my prospects. The dad one was doing something with what looked like a holographic interface at a desk tucked into the corner to my left. He looked pretty intent, so whatever he was working on must have been important to him. To my right, there was a long table with a bunch of Blyvis-sized chairs around it. I tensed and sprang forward, but on a shallow angle. I am a stealth god in low G. I was in the open less than a second and was able to quietly roll to a stop without even jostling one of the chairs. At the other end of the table, I saw my next challenge, Blyvis Girl, who I've decided to henceforth call Lucy on account of it's the first girl name that popped up. I'm fresh out of standard issue crayons, and she's doing something, going between what looks a lot like a kitchen sink and a cooktop. The only cabinet with seals around the doors was just a little bit obviously the fridge, and my best bet for something edible. A stealthy glance upward and I could see more overhead cabinets with nice, big, sturdy-looking handles. Nice. Ever so slowly, I crept for the fridge, and upon opening the left side, found it full of fruit with a spattering of vegetables. At least the colorful round things looked vaguely fruity to me. Promising. Thinking quickly, I tied the ends of the extra sleeves shut for some makeshift pockets and stuffed half a dozen different fruits down them. I avoided the foul-smelling ones and let the fridge close with a light thump. Lucy heard it and looked in time to stare at the fridge in puzzlement while I laid on the seats of the chairs to be more deeply shadowed. When she turned back to whatever she was up to, I slunk over to the other end of the table to check on the dad. He hadn't even noticed. 
By the time I was at the kitchen end, Lucy had poured something into a wide, shallow bowl and was carrying it toward the TV area, so it was a perfect opportunity for me to see if there was anything useful laying loose. One quick hop onto the table later, and I saw gold. A yellow plastic knife, not a disposable one, but one of those ones for little kids to practice using silverware with, which means that it won't be missed, and if it's found in my closet, the toddler will get the blame and face no trouble for it. Probably. I briefly thought about arming myself, but rejected it on the grounds that a kitchen knife going missing would be a big deal. It was easy for me to silently leap the gap from the table and collect my prize, but I wasn't home free yet. The cartoon noises stopped, and agitated humming, buzzing, and clicking started. I could tell it was agitated because the dad tore his attention away from his holograms and joined in the noise party. Fortunately, I'd leaped up to grab one of those handles the second the noise profile had changed, so I escaped his notice. I shimmied from cabinet handle to cabinet handle like I was Prince of Goddamned Persia, giddy with my low G capabilities, until I could sort of angle to see a family meeting going on. Lucy looked upset, her arms were waving around, and she was clutching my blanket in one of her hands, while Mom made slower humming and buzzing noises and placating gestures with all four hands. Then, the dad pointed at the door and said something with a confident posture, while the toddler, Linus because it goes with Lucy, seemed on the verge of tears. I was starting to feel a tad bit guilty, but Lucy calmed down and bobbed her head up and down right before they all broke up and started looking around. The funny thing is, all four of them were looking down low, and on Earth that would have definitely been the thing to do because lurking about the overhead storage was a downright feat of strength in 1G. However, due to factors they had no way of knowing, I was able to swing from handle to handle all the way back into the hallway, where it was just a matter of waiting a few seconds for Lucy and Linus to scamper from the bathroom to his room. Then it was a simple matter of dropping to the floor and stepping through the conveniently open closet door. Lucy had even helpfully put my blanket on my pillow for me. Mission successful. Hell, yeah. Log, 6000000, personal, Captain Yormdrill. Today was rough. Stars save us what some people will do to other living creatures. It's enough to turn the stomach. So we got the poor creature squared away in the old storage closet, which frankly should have been cleared out years ago, but I put it off just in case I might need a tea tin full of mismatched fasteners or a docu-box full of old robotics paper mags. Well, tossing the mags hurt just a little, but they were in such poor condition there was no point in keeping them. But I'm going off on a tangent. Sweetie, I know you're reading this, so I'm going to give you a warning. It was really, really bad, and you'll see why Mom and I didn't tell you about it. I started with the medical report from the shelter's initial scan bruising all over its face, arms and torso, and even some to its knees and the tops of its feet. Its hands had repeated micro-fractures, as did its ribs and forearms and kneecaps. I was honestly shocked it didn't die from the pain of so many repeated blunt trauma injuries. It seemed like its saving grace is how dense its bones are. I'm a pilot and captain, not a biologist, but any blow with that much bruises I've ever seen has broken bones but worse is that it had electrical burns about its neck. There were some details that might be useful in making the poor creature comfortable, such as the shelter theorizing that it had omnivore dentation and digestion. Hopefully we have something on hand that it can digest, and finding it is Trandy's mission. She's starting with making Vum Noon since it's usually for the infirm. I warned her that her fist try might not be successful, and she assured me that she wouldn't give up after one try. Some other interesting things. Apparently, it secretes oils on its skin, so regular bathing will be needed. It can self-regulate by secreting saline, indicating it is adapted to warm environments or sustained exertion. So maybe we should get it more blankets, I guess. I'm not an expert in this kind of thing. Then I watched part of this embedded video. The video was from the perspective of a helmet camera, so the officer's manipulator appendages gripping a stun rifle were in view. In this case, a trio of tentacles with three appendages at the ends. The camera showed the officer in the middle of a stack up for a door breach in a dynamic entry as somebody counted down from five from out of view. There was a muted boom as the door was blown open and the stack filed in screaming variations on 
Get on the ground, drop your weapons! Once the squad spread out, the camera got a view of the room, which was a lattice of walkways surrounding pits in the floor about four feet square by ten feet deep. Grav, grav, grav. 2x standard move with caution, but the officers seemed to be able to move at a great enough speed to quickly incapacitate the group of googly-eyed bipedal lizard gangsters. The officer looked into one of the pits, and the camera showed a quadrupedal mammal with large curled horns and a long split tail up to its ankles in cleaning solution, struggling to stand on obviously swollen legs. It bleated in distress, and the officer lost his lunch on the floor. End video, I really couldn't bear to see the creature we adopted in those conditions, so I stopped it there. Just knowing that a living being that had endured such fetid conditions was harrowing enough. However, things got even more stressful when Trandy went to try to feed it, and it had vanished from the storage closet. She was distraught, nearly in tears, and clutching the blanket from the shelter. Daddy, he's just gone. I looked in the rooms already. What if he's hurt himself? What if he's trapped? He's probably scared and all alone. Yoivdril was starting to get upset too, and I could see the tears welling up. But Trevdi came in clutch like the wonderful mother she is. He's in a new place, sweetie. He probably just wanted to look around and think about how little he is. He could be taking a nap pretty much anywhere and be hard to notice. Besides, I interjected, hoping to add a little stability. It can't get through the bulkhead since a biometric scan won't work. She stiffened her lip and shook the tears from her eyes and said, Okay, small. I'll take Yoivdril and we'll check the cabin mates and cubby holes. Maybe he wanted a smaller den. Clever girl. Trevdi and I searched the living and kitchen areas, and I got an earful. I know what you're doing. She chided me gently. Gently. But still I bristled. So what am I doing? Because I think I'm looking under the table for Trandy's pet. Hart, you know what you're doing? And you know I don't mean physically right now? Is that how our children should deal with taking on something painful? You know why I was against pets at all. And this star's Trevdi, it was brutal. And how does remaining detached change that? All right, all right. I certainly don't want to be a cold example, but I, my love, I do not expect you to go cuddle him in his den. Just try calling him a he and not an it. You are right, and I think I can manage that much. Mom, Daddy, he's not anywhere. We made our way back to the hallway to help the kids to a more thorough check. And what did we see? What else besides the creature sleeping on his bed under that blanket from the shelter? Void, take me! Daddy said a bad word. Yoavdril very helpfully pointed out. I think that door needs a lock, I mused. I don't think I can handle a scare like that again. Well, everyone knows how that argument went. I'm sure we all think it was memorable. Me against Trandy in her first real argument and her opponent not going easy on her, and in regards to her halfway gift, no less. For the record, you did very well, and you did get me to concede that cooping him up in there would be needlessly cruel, which is why you were in charge of when it's locked or unlocked. Dear Diary, I don't think I like growing up anymore, like you spend your whole little years looking forward to your halfway gift. But it's not just getting something cool or cute or whatever. You have to take care of it. I thought I understood, but now I know better. Today was the scariest thing that ever happened in my whole life ever. So yesterday was my halfway and we were on station so mom could do her thing. She and daddy were pretty happy so I think the cargo she sold here went for a good price. Anyway, daddy's trying to get me to go to the robot store, but he's the one who likes robots, not me. I mean, I like working on some of the maintenance bots with him, but that's because it's fun to work with daddy, not the stupid robot stuck in a crawl space again. So anyway... Mom finally convinced him that I should have a pet since a living thing can love you back. Unlike a dumb robot. The shelter was really sad, and I don't know why, but I wanted to look at the adult animals first. I just think it's that people always want the babies. But sometimes the grown-up animals never leave. Some of them were trying to scare us away from the kennels, so I knew Daddy would say no to them. But then I saw him. I learned he was a him a little later but that doesn't matter. He just had the cutest face, the right number of eyes, round ears, a pretty pink skin, 
except for some dark splotches on his cheeks and around one eye, and like this red mane of hair. I couldn't really see anything else since he was all cocooned in the blanket the shelter gave him. The shelter guy said that nobody could even get close to him, but he looked so sad that I just had to try. The let me in and not only did he not run away like he did for everybody else, but he reached out to me. That's how I knew I couldn't leave him there, even if he would. Here there are some words forcefully scribbled out not make it, but that's all just the setup. We got him home and put in him the old storage room with a nice soft bed and the blanket from the shelter. I think the shelter people must have given him a sedative because he didn't wake up even when daddy pulled him out of the transport crate. So everything was going smooth and daddy told me about how maybe he can eat fruits. So I got the idea to make vum noon for him since it's supposed to be easy to digest for sick people. Should work for a cute little lemur, right? But when I was cooking, he disappeared. Poof. Gone. Seriously, after I couldn't find him, the whole family looked everywhere, even Yoeve. I honestly thought that I'd have to just take him room to room looking for the little guy. I was super scared because I just learned about how sometimes a pack animal will go away to find a quiet place to lay down. And here there are more words scribbled out more forcefully, not get up again. But mom and daddy thought that maybe he was just looking around the quarters or wanted a smaller den to feel safe. But we found him right in his bed. Oh, and he put the bed up on one of the old shelves, so I think lemurs like him don't like to sleep on the ground. Daddy cursed real bad when he saw, then said he wants to lock him in the closet. It was my first real argument, and I could tell that Daddy was going after my points like I was a grown-up, so I had to think fast about how to defend what I was saying. I think I won, kinda. It's my job to make sure the door is locked when it's important for Sneak to stay put. That's his name, I just decided. Plus, it'll make writing about him easier with a name. I hope I can get Sneak to walk around the quarters a little, but maybe he just needs to get comfy with it. Journal Entry 2. Kant Once I was in my berth and blanket again, I cunningly pretended to be asleep while the Blyvuses made humming, buzzing, and clicking noises at each other. It was like their whole language was made to be soft and quiet, not that I minded. It still seemed like Lucy got pretty heated with her dad, though, but he remained calm and collected the entire time. I'm not sure, but I think they were having an argument. Not like a fight, but like they were making arguments about something they disagreed on. Hard to tell. However, my cunning plan to fake sleep backfired and I fell into real sleep, which wasn't a big deal or anything. But it seems like I've been asleep more than awake since getting to what I'm almost certain is the ship. One nap later, and it was time to figure out if my prizes were actually edible. Except then it was dark. Apparently it was nighttime, or whatever counts as nighttime in space. I wish I had a window in here, but none of the other rooms and quarters did either. Wonder why. Anyway, I could kind of see in the dimness, since the lights weren't shut off, only on a very dim setting, and made a wild guess that the panel by the door was the light switch. It was about even with the door handle, so I had to hop to reach it, and hey-ho, dragging a finger upwards brightens the lights, while dragging downwards dims them. It only took me three hops to get the lights to a comfortable level. Now anybody with the epicere ribbon knows you don't just cram an alien fruit into your gob and hope Jesus put it there for you to eat and not to teach you about the dangers of xenoflora. What you do is get a tiny bit of the juice on a sensitive area of your skin, like your inner forearm, and wait to see if it causes a chemical burn, rash, or horrible mutations. Admittedly, the last one hasn't ever happened, but the brass is adamant that it could happen, so we train for it. However, since I was smart enough to not be a ship rat, I had a plan to do it way faster than one fruit every 15 minutes or so. My belly was speaking to me and speaking insistently about how it was time to eat. So I applied previously observed data and relocated to the top shelf to set up my lab stash. The haul consisted of all round fruits about the size of a good orange or apple, one green fuzzy fruit with a bit of give when squeezed, one, one waxy skinned yellow that felt quite firm, two, one sort of purple thing with bumps that felt like a rind fruit, three, one pale white thing that felt almost squishy and had a slick skin, four, one red fruit that looked almost like a round strawberry with blue seeds, five, 
and one dark blue thing with a tight spiral of pale green going around it. Six. I took the pen and drew six boxes in a line down my left arm and labeled them accordingly. Then I found that my yellow plastic knife was sharp enough to cut into all of the fruits with a little convincing. My pythons rolled a nat 20 on the charisma check. Well, nothing happened immediately, so I started journaling to pass the time and get my thoughts in order. Fifteen minutes was difficult to gauge without a timepiece or, you know, a local star or anything that would denote the passage of time at regular intervals at all, but I made my best guess and checked my experiment. Fruits four and six were out. They had formed an angry rash and a mild chemical burn in their boxes, respectively. It's not that I didn't know that I had the burn, but I couldn't tell which box was the problem without looking. Anyway, step two is to put a sample on the inside of your cheeks or on your gums, and again wait. Since I couldn't do the square trick inside my mouth, I did the sensible thing and started with fruit number one. I did more journaling and considering in between samples and found that I noticed no oral burning or irritation from any of the samples, so I took a bite out of fruit number one and found that it had the consistency of a peach and the taste of blueberries mixed with pears. This was trippy as hell, but several days of not eating made swallowing it easy. The issue was, it wasn't a good idea to eat all of the fruits at once, and you have to wait a couple hours to see if it causes any stomach issues. Really, I should have just eaten a small bite, but as I said before, I was out of standard issue crayons, and there weren't any quartermasters handy to requisition any. So I just sucked on the pit of the weird peach thing and thought. So I'm on an alien ship, likely in deep space. Not ideal. I was not in immediate danger. Good. I had no way to come back home. Not ideal. I had no idea where we were except that it was probably very, very far away from Republic space. Not ideal. I was currently in the custody of Xeno civilians. Acceptable. I was currently unable to communicate with the Xenos. Not ideal. I appeared to have the status of a family pet. Demeaning and not ideal. Option 1. Arm myself and fight my way to the bridge and attempt to pilot my way home. Option 2. Make life for my captors a living hell until they land and then make my escape. Option 3. Disappear into the maintenance spaces and hide out until I spot a chance for escape. Option 4. Attempt to open a line of communication. Option 5. Just be the family cat or whatever. Option 1 involved hurting or killing the Blyvises, and I kind of liked them. So it was out. Option 2 was out for similar reasons. Option 3 had some attractions, but I also had only been able to explore the living quarter of this family, and I have no way of knowing how much bigger the ship is or if I could more effectively survive outside of the living quarters. So it was option 4 because option 5 was just me being flippant and self-deprecating. Dr. Johan isn't here to tell me that I'm using humor to avoid confronting how I got here in the first place, so shut up inner therapist voice. Log 6000000 8.20. Personal. Captain Yormdrill. Well, he has a name. I have to admit it's a good name, a fitting one anyway, and Trandy was right to be so chuffed with herself. Sneak or maybe sneaky, she and Yormdrill were still arguing about it when I left to work, and I didn't find out whether it was resolved by the time I recorded this. Besides, that wasn't the most unfair thing that happened regarding Sneak this morning, and him getting a funny name was bad enough. No, so this morning he ambles out of his little room and hands me a X Lin and a moral. Stars save me. When did he get into the fridge? Oh, but that wasn't it. He was wearing Yoey of Drill's clothes. They were a little small on him and it was adorable, which is of course completely unfair, considering what's undoubtedly in store for him. Stars, I'm going to cry over this weird limmer thing, aren't I? Well, Trevdy was right, and I shouldn't shirk the light for fear of its going out. Well, I had an exciting four hours of being the warm body on the bridge for the next four hours just to make sure that if something went wrong, there was somebody to do an emergency hyperspace drop, then lunch and making the rounds. Honestly, I was more interested in how the kids were doing with trying to get Sneak to eat, which had memorable results. I made a brief detour to maintenance to see if we had any locking door handles that, that I could use to contain Trandy's new pet. I learned Sneak had gorged himself on Tolkies, ten of them. 
Well, at least we know he likes something we have, but I doubt an omnivore can survive off of one fruit. Anyway, I made some gentle suggestions that perhaps Sneak should get something better than a level 1 scan. Trandy and Yoivdril got very excited, and I really hope I didn't plant false hope. Anyway, we took the spare mattress from the unused berth in Yoivdril's room and cut a chunk to fit the shelf where Sneak has made his den and made a show of swapping it out for the old floor pillow he'd been sleeping on so that he wouldn't notice me changing out the door handles. Normally, I wouldn't bother, but Sneak seems like a pretty canny whatever he is, and he has had poor experiences with confinement before. I think so long as we keep the door open and him under our eyes, he won't notice much, and if he's distressed in the night, he'll let us know with vocalizations, I'm sure. Dear Diary, so today was a lot better. Sneaky, Yoiv Drill changed his name because he said Sneak sounded kind of mean. I'm past my halfway, so I couldn't just agree or dismiss him like a little kid would, so I heard him out and helped him figure out his points and what he thought about them, and pretty much convinced myself. So anyway, I thought he was cute in the blanket, but stars? When he came out of the bathroom, he was in Yoiv's jammies, and it was just the cutest. I asked Mom, and she didn't dress him, and Daddy's being very hands-off with Sneaky, so he must have done it himself. I think he did it yesterday when he was missing, because he left his blanket behind in Yoiv's room. When I go to class tomorrow, I'll ask around if anybody has boy clothes for like a six-year-old and also knows how to sew. He has two pairs of pants on and the top one is on backward, so I think having the tail hole bugged him. So anyway, I lead him by the hand to the kitchen and told him to stay put while I got the vum noon reheated for him. Mom was having breakfast at the table with Yoiv and Daddy, so I knew she was watching while I worked. Oh, this is when I told everyone that I named him Sneak and Yoiv, and I had our argument. Mom and Daddy just watched, so I must have done a good job teaching Yoiv. Anyway, once the vum noon was reheated, I put it in a bowl and set it down for Sneaky. He didn't like it. He picked up the bowl and smelled the food, which I thought he'd do before tasting it. I didn't expect him to almost puke because of the smell. He put the bowl back down and kind of slid backward, away from it. Anyway, I just put it in the biomass disposal, like I was halfway expecting anyway, and thought about what else I could try. Then he just opened the fridge and took out a whole bunch of tokies. Then he just sat down with his back against a cabinet and ate them all. All of them. Like ten. Daddy only ever eats three if he just sits there and eats them like that and he's a grown-up and way bigger than Sneaky. It was crazy. He collected the pits and walked over to the biomass disposal and dropped them in. I told him he was a good boy, even though I was surprised he figured that out from watching me throw something away once. I needed to try to find out about Sneak since, like, he kept on doing unexpected things like disappearing and figuring out there's a fruit he can eat while nobody was watching him. So I asked mom if she would watch him, so he didn't disappear again, and Yoiv asked if he could play with him. I didn't know if Sneaky liked playing or not, but I told him he could try and to let Sneaky go if he tried to walk away. So he got all excited, and Sneaky let him lead him off to his room. Mom went with them, and I went to the desk to see if we had any useful info in the ship database. Even if I don't get the right answers, I might get an idea about what questions to ask the next time we're synced up to the net. So anyway, I started by putting in what I thought were the unique things about Sneaky. Bipedal, sparse hair, he put on clothes himself, binocular vision, one set of opposable thumbs, omnivore teeth, really sneaky and smart. There were tons of results. It was hard to know where to start, so I just poked a random link and started reading about Huli and Pack lemurs. They weren't very much like Sneaky, their hair was all wrong and they had tails. Plus, they were super tiny, but they were kind of interesting anyway. The next link was also too different from Sneaky, but I noticed that both kinds of lemurs were very curious and liked to explore everywhere they could reach. The next thing that I read about were wrong too, but curiosity jumped out at me again. It was like that again and again, and the articles on all these different kinds of lemurs or pandas, or even some kinds of big bugs were no help at all on what Sneaky can eat besides Tokis, except that all of the omnivores need a varied diet. Well, duh. I'm an omnivore, so I need lots of different fruits and vegetables, some meat once in a while. It was super frustrating. I'll ask around the ship tomorrow and maybe somebody will have some ideas. I gave up on figuring out what kind of animal he was from a keyword query, 
and just did a search on bruise treatments for mammals. It turned out that a lot of the stuff that we use on the ship can cause rashes or even burns for other species. But there were a few things that were pretty low risk. One of the things was a pain relief cream that we have in our first aid kits that looks like it's safe to use on pretty much every kind of lemur or panda discovered. So just because Sneaky is bigger shouldn't make much of a difference. I can use the lowest active ingredient dosage one just to be safe. So it was like that all day long until Daddy came back for dinner. Sneaky had some bulia, but not as much as this morning. So maybe he was just really hungry. And Mom said that he didn't look more sick all day and even played pretty actively with Yoiv. He said that Sneaky was awesome and super strong, but he's a little kid, so I don't know how strong super strong is to him. Mom didn't jump in and just tried to get Yoiv to explain what he means, but he couldn't do it, except that Sneaky likes him. Daddy mentioned that the shelter only did a level one scan on him, and a better scan might give us better information. Daddy put the lock in and made me distract Sneaky by giving his den a better mattress, which he seemed to like. But I think he knew something was weird. He's like really smart for any kind of animal. I'm already looking to see if there's a good vet at the next stop. Maybe they'll know about what Sneaky is. Journal entry 3. Date 112. Name. Greg George OK. So I'm going with starting to count time from when I got adopted from the shelter in years, then weeks, then days. This should help with the whole sanity thing, since not having a proper date has been bugging me. A sanity journal should increase sanity, not decrease it after all. And honestly, even though the date is wrong, seeing it there on the header of the first page of this entry warms the copper jacketed lump of depleted uranium masquerading as my heart. I can almost hear Dr. Johan saying that if the old stable touchstones are gone, close enough is good enough. Thank you, internal therapist voice. So today was pretty good. I woke up early and went to the bathroom to do the usual. It's one thing to manage waste out in the wilderness on a hike, or maybe on a deep recon, but that's outside. Just dig a hole or find a tree and bam! You're good. But when you're stuck indoors for days on end without even a bucket, if I could speak Blibus, I'd spend at least an hour lavishing them with praise for providing me with the sheer luxury of a toilet. Not only that, but a toilet that fucking flushes. This little family was downright civilized by comparison to my more recent accommodations, but to be fair to the spider centaur clickety-clack things, they didn't really know any better. Probably. If it was a normal toilet instead of that weird squat kind, it'd have been heavenly. But that was a problem for later since I hadn't eaten for a while. Oh, and the absolute bliss of having a door, an opaque door that locks from the inside. There was even a step stool tucked away in the cabinet under the sink, probably for Linus, so I could wash my hands. The right hand tap was hot, and pushing them toward the wall opened them. Madness, but hot water to wash my hands in was absolutely divine. I swear I almost felt tears welling up over that shit. Next was the family seeing me walking around for the first time. First the dad came out of the master room and just sort of stared at me. It was weird. Anyway, since I'm so polite and not at all to baffle him, I decided to return the two fruits that I eliminated. I wish I had a camera. Speaking of cameras, Mom and Lucy did just a bit more than look at me slack-jawed like the dad. No they fetched up what could only be either cameras or gizmos that had cameras in them like Xeno's smartphones. I tried to look nonchalant while they very obviously took pictures or holo captures. I did not make more than one heroic pose because of how hilarious it was. Whatever, I'm not naked, and I'm not dragging a blanket around, so it's worth it. Hopefully, that at least upgraded me from puppy to smart boy at the least. Anyway, so once Lucy and Mom were done fawning over me, Christ, I'm probably the blavest version of cute, Lucy took me by the hand and tugged me toward the hall. I went along, because what else was I going to do? Passive resistance against a little girl? Little in the age sense, seeing as she stood head and shoulders above me, and was a lot less imposing now that I wasn't huddled in a corner here. There is a single dot of ink in a relatively deep depression in the page that likely carries on to several pages behind it. Anyway. Now she's just a very tall blue little girl in a dress. Besides, that was toward the kitchen where Fruit One was. Hell yeah, Fruit One for breakfast. 
Hey, at least I didn't give the people number names. So Lucy had a similar idea to mine. I say similar because she didn't give me a plate of tastefully arranged fruit one slices. No, she put this bowl of purple chunky mush on the floor and looked at me expectantly, so I picked it up to give it a sniff. Not that I was going to eat it, but if it smelled okay, I'd start the safety tests. I also didn't intend on insulting Lucy's cooking, but I really couldn't help it. Seriously, I'm not making a joke to help myself cope with the situation. This was a full-on involuntary reaction. I dry heaved. Just one whiff of this rank ass mush and my body decided that I needed to evacuate the meager calories that I had painstakingly acquired last night. I managed to hold in my puke and the girl didn't seem too ruffled by it. Kind of like she was prepared for me not wanting to eat the stuff. Maybe it was her culture's version of broth for sick people. Anyway, she went and dumped the stuff in the garbage, and I got myself an armful of fruit ones. It feels so damn good to have a full belly. The family was discussing something over breakfast, and I just cleaned up after myself and enjoyed the feeling of not being hungry anymore. An all-fruit diet is probably not the best for me, but it's certainly better than the Atmo diet. What they were eating smelled pretty good, but I can't really trust anything cooked on account of the whole poison for me might be nutrients for them thing. So I'd just have to muddle through on raw foodstuffs for a while. More than likely, they want me to not die of malnutrition, so maybe they'll find some information that can help. The dad left, probably to do his job on the ship, and Linus toddled up to me and said something to me in that weirdly quiet language. Dang it, kid. I don't speak Blyvusian. He reached out toward me, and I got the hint and took his hand. He was absolutely thrilled. You'd think I gave him chocolate straight from Earth by how his eyes sparkled. Well, I was led by the hand back to his room with Mom hovering behind. I could feel her wary eyes on me between my shoulders. Don't worry, Mom. It's cool. Linus isn't bothering me. I don't think he could hurt me if he tried. If I was back home... I'd suspect that this was a part of my treatment program. I'm pretty sure that my soft spots are in my med file, and it's not like something like this wasn't done before. But of course, Dr. Johan was far away and had nothing to do with Linus introducing me to his cadre of plush friends. I smiled and nodded, and hugged and petted the plush toys when offered. It felt cozy. A kid won't play with you if he's in danger, after all. Eventually, he got that look that boys get when they think they're about to do something brave, and he patted my head. I laughed, quietly. Just because Linus feels safe enough to play with a weird alien creature doesn't mean that habit went away. Well, it's more like silently. He looked worried, so I smiled and reached out to pat his head in return. Linus almost exploded. The kid ran in a circle, waving all of his arms around like he'd just won a gold medal and ended it by wrapping said flailing appendages around me in a hug. Well, slap me and call me Sally if that shit wasn't the cutest thing I ever did see. Now I'd been sitting down for a spell at that point, and my legs wanted stretching, so I just returned the hug and stood up for a stretch. Apparently that was amazing. Linus's eyes went all wide and he made this ee noise with the biggest smile that would fit across his face. I looked over at Mom, and she didn't seem upset, so I stood up with him again. The next few hours were spent finding various ways I could lift, carry, or bear Linus while either plodding or gently trotting in circles around his room. Of course, I was constantly checking on Mom to see if she was getting frightened. Linus was pretty light, so I could have kept it up all day, but Mom put him down for a nap, and I was able to go to my lab to sample fruit too. It crunched like an apple and tasted like honey with cyan pepper in it. Not too bad. I paid attention to the family talking at dinner, but I couldn't make heads or tails of any of it. My guess it's along the lines of, how was your day and good, yours? And Papa, I rode the puppy like a horsey. I had me a fruit too while they weren't paying attention. After that, Mom and Lucy made this big procession of cutting a chunk off of the mattress in the spare berth off, and putting it in my shelf made birth with some sheets, the shelter blanket, and a heavy quilt. Yes, your offering pleases me. Now I shall not raid the bedrooms for my favorite blankets. This was done, of course, to distract me from the dad swapping out the door handle for one with a lock on it. On the one hand, I don't think he's trying to be malicious, 
But on the other hand, I'm really done being locked into small boxes. Just because I'm not going to hurt him doesn't mean I won't make him pay.